Welcome to High Cheese. It's Friday, October 20th, 2023. So I want to go over Joe Biden's speech last night. And remember what Rahm Emanuel once said? Don't let a crisis go to waste. And that's what we see in this speech last night by Biden. And the $105 billion that he's looking to spend. And you have to understand this $105 billion is above and beyond what the normal budget process would end up with. They're called supplemental bills. So essentially what happens is every year uh, Congress strikes their budget, the president signs it. And then you have this series of these supplemental bills to pay for things that come along. And this is a supplemental bill. It's not a part of a budget that's going to be negotiated. It's part of extra spending. So we've got these budgets that are already accumulating two billion dollars, two trillion dollars in debt every year, and we're just adding to it. So Rahm Emanuel, don't let a crisis go to waste. So out of this one hundred and five billion dollars, Biden wants to spend sixty one billion on Ukraine, and isn't it ironic that he wants sixty one billion now? And earlier in the year, he wanted to do a supplemental budget for $24 billion. So we, we've now upped Ukrainian aid from $24 billion that he originally wanted to $61 billion. And this is in spite of what the American people want. Most recent polls that came out said American people don't want to fund this war anymore over in Ukraine. And this includes $130 billion we've already spent over there. So now we're looking at about $190 billion that the Biden administration wants to spend over there. In less than two years. But again, don't let a crisis go to waste. And then Biden wants to spend $14.3 billion on Israel. And that's about right. But there's no need to rush it right now because Israel is well equipped to take care of themselves right now. And with the support we're already giving them, they should be able to handle themselves. Unless things escalate out of control. But again, I want to go back and, you know, everybody was anticipating him talking about Israel, him talking about a true ally of the United States, a place where we truly have vital national interests. But he wants to bait and switch. Oh, you want you think I'm going to talk about Israel? Nope. I'm going to talk about Ukraine and I'm going to up the ante with Ukraine. And this sixty one billion dollars came to the delight. Of the rhinos, the defense industry, Fox News, all these people that want us to have never-ending wars who are just so giddy, so happy, because they don't care. Unending wars are a good way to keep the people in their place and allows them to keep themselves in power. And with that said, I wanted to go to a clip. It's uh, from Fox News, and it's with Britt Hume. And Britt Hume was one happy guy last night. So let's go to the clip and then we'll come back and discuss. Well, I think it may be remembered as one of the best, if not the best speeches of his presidency. He was firm. He was unequivocal. He was strong as he has been, particularly uh, in recent days when he was before he went to Israel and while he was over there. I was struck by the fact that he spent as much time as he did on Ukraine. And I think it was a good thing that he did because. Well, how many kids do you have fighting in wars? Brett? Are you affected by the inflation that this excessive spending by our government has caused? Nah, you don't care. You got your money. The heck with the middle class, the upper middle class, the working class. They're the ones that fight the war. They're the ones that are taking it on the chin with inflation because of this spending. It's all about a calculation to these people. It's all about a political calculation for these people. And up until this point... It's been you, me, your family that has been paying the price. And with that said, I want to go to a comment. And this is an extremely cold comment that was made by Shalanda Young. She's the director of Biden's Office of Management and Budget. And here's what she said. Excessive military spending. It strengthens our American economy. It expands production lines and creates new jobs. Oh, it's good for you. It creates jobs. It's good for the economy keeps people spending money. 
And what's the price? Death? Death of soldiers in foreign places? And how did the Afghanistan war work out for us? Tell me that. All those poor kids that were killed? All that money that we spent for nothing? And let's look at Ukraine. How about that counteroffensive that was so, supposed to be so successful? Well, it went nowhere. Actually, Russia is taking more territory up north. And Biden wants to add another $60 billion to that fiasco just to get poor Ukrainian soldiers killed. And the way it's going, eventually it will be our kids. I don't think that's an equal trade-off. But for them, it is. And they think you're foolish enough that you're going to buy into this. Because here's what you have to understand about the military-industrial complex. Now, you've heard the term too big to fail. And that name was monikered during the 2008 financial crisis where we bailed out the banks. And the reason we bailed out the banks, because if we didn't, the entire financial system would collapse. Everything would collapse. So they said. And that's the goal of the military-industrial complex. They want to be so big, they want the economy beholden to them, that they got to keep everything churning. they got to keep the war machine churning, because if, if not, everything will collapse. That's their goal. It's right out of the page of how the banks handled the financial crisis. Now, they are not there yet, but they're getting close. And as I said before, all of this dispense spending that's being borrowed is increasing interest rates and helps cause inflation. Now, again, the powers that be, whether it's in the White House, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, it doesn't affect them to a point. And they don't care how high interest rates go and how high inflation goes, as long as they can make money on it. And with that said, I just want to take us to a clip, and it's from uh, Bloomberg. And they're interviewing Joanne Feeney. Joanne Feeney is a senior portfolio manager at some firm. And she says what the realities are. So let's go to the clip, and then we'll come back and discuss longer term concepts into the near term drama over the past two weeks where everything seems to have changed in the Middle East. How in the past two weeks have you shifted any of your views, if at all? Yeah, so, you know, the past two weeks, the, the rise of geopolitical risks that we've seen is something we have been talking about for a long time. It's been on our list, whether it's Europe and Ukraine, China and Taiwan. We've always mentioned the Middle East as a potential flashpoint. Uh, what has changed, though, is probably most directly for the U.S., a rise in our military budget. And I think that's one of the reasons, by the way, why we're seeing an increase in interest rates uh, is in recognition that the U.S. is going to be spending more uh, that the deficits are going to be sustained or grow. And I'm sure those comments were prompted by Janet Yellen's comments earlier this week, where she said that the United States is capable of funding a two-front war. So according to Yellen, we can fund a war in Ukraine and we can fund a war in the Middle East. What she's not telling you is that it's all going to be on borrowed money. So we shall see. Oh, and before I forget, I just want to uh, highlight a couple of other items in Biden's supplemental military bill. He wants to add $2 billion for Taiwan, $9 billion for humanitarian aid. And part of that is going to Palestine. And rest be sure that a good chunk of the money that we're giving to Palestine is going to wind up in the hands of Hamas. And I have no confidence that the Biden administration will able to stop that. We've got $6.4 billion for the border and $1.2 billion for fentanyl. Now, what the Biden administration and the deep state and the rhinos and the uniparty want to do, they want to lump this all together in one bill. They don't want to separate them out. And the reason they don't want to separate them out is because there's a lot of pushback on Ukrainian aid. And because of politics, the Biden administration and the Uniparty think that, oh, let's lump it all together and we'll force people into funding Ukraine. But I don't think that's going to happen. I'd be very surprised if that's going to happen. Whoever winds up in the, in the, uh, as the Speaker of the House, I think Ukraine will be pulled out and voted on separately. So we shall see. 
Now, I want to take a few moments and talk about some of the high-ranking officials in the Biden administration that have ties to the BLO. And I want to go to an article here. It's from Revolver News. And it has to do with a, uh, a Maher Bitar, who serves as the senior director for intelligence programs in Joe Biden's National Security Council. And again, this is from Revolver News. It says, Biden's choice of Bitar for a senior intelligence role within the NSC is largely forgotten, though it generated considerable controversy in the immediate aftermath of Bitar's appointment in 2021. Numerous reports emerged of Bitar's history of activism on behalf of Palestine that extended into support for Palestinian organizations that have been accused of being friendly to terror groups like Hamas. The Washington Free Beacon reported that Bitar was not only a member, but also an executive, an executive director of the controversial Students for Justice in Palestine. SJP is known for its radical anti-Israeli perspective. SJP students at Vassar College, for instance, drew controversy for selling T-shirts depicting Leila Khalid, a convicted terrorist and airplane hijacker, in order to raise money for the Palestinian resistance. The SJP has, of course, responded to the recent Hamas terror group attacks on Israel by organizing a day of resistance in support of Hamas. Another SJP chapter at Tufts University praised the creativity of the Hamas terrorists. It is rather remarkable that a senior intelligence official in the Biden administration would have held a senior position in such an organization. Now, let me bring you to another article. This is from the New York Post. It says Homeland Security officer on leave after it was revealed that she worked for the PLO and wrote an F blank, blank, blank Israel post. An asylum official with the Department of Homeland Security has been put on leave after it was revealed that she once served as a spokesperson for the Palestine Liberation Organization and recently wrote F, but, 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 Israel in numerous posts supporting Hamas, according to reports. Nawa Ali, an officer with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, an agency of Homeland Security, worked as a public affairs officer for the PLO's delegation to the U.S. in 2016 and 2017, the Daily Wire reported. Ali has expressed her support for Palestinian causes for years and recently posted inflammatory comments about Israel in the wake of the surprise attack by Hamas. Now, you have to understand this individual here She's an asylum official. She's part of the bureaucracy that determines who's going to be let in to this country based on seeking asylum. And it appears to me that she's compromised, as well as Bitar. Then there's another story from a State Department official that quit because he did not agree with the U.S. support of Israel. So how many more of these people that are in Biden's government? closely tied to national security that support Hamas. Again, this is all about the incompetence of the Biden administration. In my last episode, I pointed out that Jake Sullivan, two weeks before the Hamas attack on Israel, was saying, oh, the Middle East is quiet. It's as quiet as it's been in years. Everything's good. And then there was the story of an envoy to Iran, Bob Malley, that appears to have been giving sensitive documents to Iran. And then we have Egyptian intelligence warning the United States about the pending Hamas attack. And this is what happens when you have an incompetent government that is filled with people that do not have the interest of the United States at heart. And then you factor in the fact that we've got an open border. Who's in this country? What terrorists are in this country? And who let them in? Whether they snuck through the border or whether we have PLO advocates in our bureaucracy that are letting these people in. It's not a good situation for this country. It's a dangerous situation for this country. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if more and more of these Hamas sympathizers are exposed. Now, I also want to talk about the number of doctors that are anti-Semites and have come out as anti-Semites and supporting Hamas. Supporting the butcher of kids, the decapitation of kids. And these doctors have come out and said, yep, yeah, I'm okay with that. But why should I be surprised? Because one thing I've realized with COVID and the pandemic is that our doctors have been politicized. Whether they align themselves with the Democratic Party or a party that pushed a bad vaccine on people, they have become politicized to the detriment of our medical profession. But here's a question I have. Say, say you're Jewish and you have to go to the doctor and you go into a doctor that's an anti-Semite. He may not or she may not have come out and officially said it, but secretly she's an anti-Semite or he's an anti-Semite. Is that Jewish person going to get the best services from that doctor or worse? It's just absolutely terrible. And this is the dilemma that the world's in today, because I really do think that evil has taken over a good chunk of this world. And when you have doctors supporting the decapitation of babies, that's evil. And I do feel sorry for Jewish people. How are they supposed to know now whether a doctor they go to is going to provide them services? How are we to know as non-Jewish people? Say you have a conversation with your doctor and the doctor's a left-wing nut. You don't know it. And he finds out that you're a Republican or you're a Trump supporter. Is he going to give you a wrong prescription? This is the state of the world today. So we shall see. So the federal budget came out with the fiscal year 2023 deficit, and it hit $1.7 trillion just for the fiscal year. Now, I've got reports, and I haven't looked at the numbers, but apparently this number is actually closer to $2 trillion because the Biden administration, the bookkeepers in the Biden administration are fudging the numbers as it relates to student loans. And I'll get back to you on that. And I wouldn't be surprised. You know, take a look at what we've been given for this year with the constant revisions, with these economic numbers, the accounting mistake with aid to Ukraine. So it wouldn't surprise me that they fudge some of these numbers in order to get the deficit down as low as possible. So we shall see. So the last thing I want to talk about is the Speaker of the House. And Jim Jordan, after three rounds, pulled his name out of it. And quite frankly, why are people blaming Matt Gates on this? Matt Gates and those eight representatives are trying to stop this country from smashing head first into a wall. And it has to do with government spending. And again, the reason that they moved to oust McCarthy was because of government spending, because of the deals that he cut with the Biden administration to keep this massive deficit going. And Jim Jordan had paid the price for this. A number of reasons that he, he paid the price for this is that there's a number of Republicans that are just spiteful. They don't like what Matt Gates did. And he's like, I'll show him. And they wouldn't support Jim Jordan. And the other thing is, you have to realize, we're smoking out the rhinos through this process. Now, there were 20 plus people in the last round that didn't vote for Jim Jordan. And you have to understand the game that's being played behind the scenes. These people are uniparty people or uniparty wannabes. They get pressure from the lobbyists. Oh, we can't have Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan wants to cut spending. That's not good for our business. We still have some war hawks in there that are looking to curry favors with defense contractors. 
But with that said, I want to go to a clip, and it's with Newt Gingrich, and he's attacking Matt Gates, and it's not helpful. Uh, Gingrich, former Speaker of the House, ethically compromised, now a member of the Fox crew, has hung his hat with Fox, and he seems to have a blind eye about spending for some reason. And I think for him, it's all about politics right now, spiteful politics within the Republican Party. And you have to understand is that there is a war going on in the Republican Party. And that's not a bad thing because this country will come out stronger and better once these uniparty Republicans are smoked out. And you hear the press saying, oh, it's chaos. We've got crisis and we need the Republicans to get together and get a speaker so we can push the Biden agenda. And this Biden agenda is wrecking the country. All right, let's go to this Newt Gingrich clip, and then we'll come back and discuss. 96% of the Republicans voted for McCarthy. 4% voted against him. From my position as a longtime Republican activist, they're traitors. All eight of them should, in fact, be primaried. They should all be driven out of public life. What they did was to go to the other team to cause total chaos. We ought to be focusing on Biden we ought to be focusing on the economy. We ought to be focusing on the border. Well, Newt, they just did the same thing to Jordan today. I think it was like 11% of Republicans voted against Jordan. And a vast majority of Republicans voted for Jordan. So that don't fly. Because what you're claiming they did to McCarthy, they just did to Jordan. And this whole thing about working against Biden. Now, that's just ridiculous. Matt Gates was trying to stop the chaos that was going on by complying with the Biden agenda. This high debt is just unacceptable. This continued funding of Ukraine is going to get us into World War III. It's going to result with boots on the ground in Ukraine. And that's what you foreknew. Now, what I just heard behind the scenes is that McCarthy is trying to push Tom Emmer, a never Trumper as the next candidate for Speaker of the House. A never-Trumper. And that will likely go down in flames, too. And quite frankly, let this continue and continue. Because I don't think most people care. Just the Washington insiders that are looking at this, and they thrive on scaring the American people. Because quite frankly, they can't function without scaring the American people. And you take a look at Trump, and you take a look at his polls. Americans are fed up with Washington. They're fed up with the games that they're playing to our detriment. So we shall see. Thank you very much for listening. You have a good week and I will talk to you next Saturday.